Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, winter blast. More snow sweeps New Jersey, prompting weather alerts across the state today, leading to unsafe conditions in some areas. Is this the end of our snow drought? Not a major event, but enough to lead to some disruption in some slippery streets and, and, and uh, uh, walkways. So we're just not used to this. Also, expanding access to school meals. With a new bill signed today by Governor Murphy, thousands more kids will be eligible for free and reduced lunch. In addition to ensuring our children are fed and nourished, this legislation will also, and I mean that literally, give our kids the support they need to fully focus on their studies and ultimately excel in their lives. And of course, it will make life in New Jersey a little more affordable. Plus, in a new report, researchers find a high number of plastic particles in bottled water you might be drinking. I think if you have the chance to reduce plastic intake, since we don't know what the health effects are yet, I think that's a good decision. And after 50 years of legislative service, longtime state senator and former New Jersey governor Richard Cody says his farewell to public office. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Well, it may not be one for the books, but New Jersey is blanketed in another coat of snow today, about one to three inches for most of the state, four to six in the northwestern areas, giving us the first statewide accumulation of snow since March 2022, according to forecasters. Hundreds of school districts closed or opened with delays. State offices also opened two hours late. That's because the snow turned turned over to a wet mix, making it a slower ride for early commuters. The good news, no additional flooding is expected from this storm. It's been a long month of heavy rain events combined with snowfall. As of late this afternoon, the National Weather Service lifted most of the winter weather advisories in place for central and North Jersey counties. If you're disappointed by today's totals that they weren't higher, state climatologist Dave Robinson is optimistic. We have plenty of winter still to come, and climatologically, the snowiest portion of our winter is still to come in late January through February into very early March. So we have yet to come close to closing the book on this winter. We continue our coverage of the federal investigation into last summer's cargo ship fire in Port Newark. The Coast Guard and National Transportation Safety Board today continued their public hearing with multiple high-ranking members of the Newark Fire Division testifying. As Ted Goldberg reports, their statements show firefighters battling the blaze were faced with nearly impossible challenges at every turn. Over an hour into this uh, trying to free Akabu, let alone we haven't found Brooks, and it's like, you know, so, and we're 12 stories up. Battalion Chief Al Maresca described the chaos faced by Newark firefighters last summer, contending with a growing fire and widespread problems with communication. Sometimes you hear something, sometimes you didn't. It, it was, uh, I guess, because of all the metal. This, depending on where you stood, you know, if I moved one foot to the right or left, sometimes you didn't hear anything. The structure of the ship being steel, is going to block a lot of the radio communications. So if there's steel between two radios, that steel could be blocking those communications. Over the last two sessions, the Coast Guard and NTSB hearing investigating last summer's deadly fire in Port Newark has focused on how firefighters approach the fire, which ultimately led to the deaths of Wayne Brooks Jr. and Augusto Akabu. Investigators explained how unfamiliar territory may have led to the tragedy. You're trained, if you become lost or disoriented, find a wall, because in most normal circumstances, if you can find a wall, you can find egress. It would have been very logical that once Firefighter Brooks located a wall, he would have followed that wall with an understanding that that would ultimately lead him to 
away off of the deck. The egress on the starboard side would have been in the engine casing or engine housing area, which not being familiar with the ship, he may not have recognized or realized. Battalion Chief Maresca testified that his firefighters weren't given a map of the ship when they arrived and took on a fire very different from what they're used to. What, if any, specialized equipment are you aware of that the Newark Fire Department has specific to fighting fires on ships? I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any. The structure of the Grande Costa Devoria led to inconsistent messages coming from firefighters' radios. When people did hear each other, there were still problems getting messages across. We were trying to communicate with that the foreman or whatever, um, just trying to communicate find out what was going on it was hard enough. The, the language barrier was very hard. I need that crane. Can we get that crane to operate? And the guy goes, I don't know if we can. We may not be allowed to because of Port Authority. And I don't know if we can get to the control panel. And it turned out later, again, because of the communication, the crane he ended up getting me was uh, the small little one. Communication breakdowns didn't stop at getting wrong cranes. Maresca testified that he wasn't told that the ship had deployed its carbon dioxide based firefighting system. And nobody told him it didn't work out because a waterproof door failed to close. That was described by testimony from second in command Benito LaFauci last week. When, if ever, were you informed that the carbon dioxide fire suppression system had been discharged? Uh, no one ever said anything to me, but when I did go up the steps, I opened up, um, I'm not sure what floor, one of the floors, just to see what they had, like if I could see anything, trying to get a little layout. And as soon as I went in there, I lost my breath. And I knew that they had a, to try something to deploy the system. I thought it was used. I, I thought maybe that's why the, we weren't seeing fire. I thought maybe they had knocked the fire down. I didn't know that they had, I found out later that they never had ever sealed the whole place. They never did it correctly. More leaders from Newark's fire division will testify this week as the hearing will continue for at least two more days, shining a light on a dark chapter in the city's history of firefighting. In Union, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. For years, research has consistently shown black homeowners are facing discrimination during the home appraisal process, despite federal laws on the books designed to prevent it. Data compiled over a five-year period on millions of homes revealed black and Latino-owned properties receive appraisal values far lower than their white counterparts. As senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, the state is launching a new program to address the problem after a bill to prevent the discrimination stalled in the legislature. I definitely have experienced uh, appraisal bias here in Newark. Vivian Cox Fraser says she's seen homes in predominantly black neighborhoods get low ball appraisals versus comparable homes in mostly white neighborhoods. National studies have backed that up. Realtors will sometimes advise a black family to hide evidence of their existence before appraisers walk through their homes. The realtor will say, remove all your personal items, any photos, anything from your house, basically whitewash your house <laughs> so that when the appraiser comes in, you'll get a higher value. Your appraisal might be less simply because you're black. And that's absurd. That shouldn't be what is happening. That is racism at its core. And it is absolutely a fact that we've seen discrimination in this process. New Jersey's Attorney General Matt Platkin says he's launched a new initiative against appraisers who undervalue homes based on protected classes like race, gender, or religion. The notice warns New Jersey law prohibits discrimination not just by the appraisers who conduct the appraisal, but also by the other entities involved in selecting an appraiser and using the appraisal to decide whether and on what terms to extend a mortgage or other financing to a a prospective borrower. They're subject to our civil rights laws and we're going to enforce them and protect people uh, as they're going through, whether it be a home purchase or a home sale, as well as ensure that communities of color are not 
being artificially devalued. The attorney generals created a new task force to investigate cases of alleged bias in home appraisals and refer them to the state's division on civil rights. When even one home's under appraised, it can drag down property values across the whole neighborhood and bar black families from closing a wide racial wealth gap that's persisted across decades in New Jersey. That's a college education. That's retirement. That's buying a whole new house for your kids. That is genuine wealth that you can pass on to your to the next generation that's being denied. Advocates applaud the attorney general's decision to target potentially biased appraisals. Platkin acted after New Jersey lawmakers failed to pass a bill that would have punished violators with steep penalties. Republican Bob Singer opposed the bill. Where is this rampant in New Jersey? And, and let's understand something. Is the task force going to be with appraisers? Realtors, mortgage bankers and bankers, those are all the people affected by this. Singers in the banking business, he's not convinced there's a problem and predicts appraisers will start avoiding minority neighborhoods. We're all against discrimination. Now, that, there's no question about it. It's against the law now. But show us where it's happening. Let's correct it. Instead, we're taking this sledgehammer and so say, let's go after those bad actors and let's, put, let's give them a $10,000 fine. The initiative's effective immediately and includes anti-discrimination training for appraisers and public education to raise awareness. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Well, more students will now have access to free school meals in New Jersey. Governor Murphy today signed legislation expanding eligibility to the state program. It means some 60,000 kids will be added to the pool of families who qualify. The new law expands the income eligibility to take part in the program from just under $60,000 a year for a family of four to a little more than $67,000 a year. This is also the first time students in private schools will be eligible. The the previous school meal program was only open to public school students. Now, according to federal data, more than 395,000 students in New Jersey received a free or reduced breakfast or lunch during the 2019-2020 school year. But the State Department of Education says some 450,000 public school children here are considered economically disadvantaged. Though it doesn't come cheap, the program will cost the state roughly $34 million. The bill is just one of many signed by the governor today before the noon deadline of this session. Otherwise, it would have died. So in addition to ensuring our children are fed and nourished, this legislation will also, and I mean that literally, give our kids the support they need to fully focus on their studies and ultimately excel in their lives. And of course, it will make life in New Jersey a little more affordable for working and middle class families throughout our state. Researchers are offering a reality check on the bottled water you pick up at the grocery store. It turns out a standard size bottle can contain up to 100 times more plastic particles than previously thought. A new study published by scientists at Rutgers and Columbia University found one liter of water contained some 240,000 tiny plastic fragments. They're known as nanoplastics, which researchers say could be even more dangerous than the microplastics found virtually everywhere. I recently asked the co-author of the study, Dr. Phoebe Stapleton of Rutgers University, what that means for your health. Dr. Stapleton, it's great to have you on the show. Let me just start with the basics here because these findings are pretty significant. What specifically did you find uh, on average with these nanoplastics when looking at uh, water? Yes, yeah, so previous studies had looked at micro size plastics in bottled water, and we uh, were able to take one step further with this technology to look at nano sized plastics as well. They're about a thousand times smaller than the micro sized plastics. We were able to confirm the micro sized plastic findings, but also identify about a quarter of a million on average nano-sized plastics within a liter of bottled water. So is this new, meaning did we know that nanoplastics existed before? Because, of course, we've um, had research for years about the microplastics in water. So we, as scientists, kind of, I guess, had that gut feeling or knew that they should be there. But having the tools and the methodology to be able to not only quantify them, but identify the chemistry of what type of particles was there 
was new because of course they're invisible. You can't see them in the air, you can't see them in the water. In one, it was pretty clear that it's likely coming from the packaging itself, the bottle or the capping, that process of it. But from the other two, the greatest percentage was not that type of plastic. So it was either coming, we theorize, may have been in the filtering process of the water, or as you say, from the source water itself. You all didn't list those brands of water that you tested. I'm guessing that's for reason. But for those who do drink bottled water, and, and there's virtually none among us who haven't at one point, um, what are the health implications, if any, that we should be concerned about? So you're right. We didn't list the, the uh, types of water that it was or the brands, um, but they were commercially available products. And the health effects are still under investigation. Uh, we know that these nano-sized plastics are of greater concern because they're able to breach biological barriers. They're able to get through the GI system. They're able to get through the lung as well and um, translocate or move to other tissues in the body. And then the question that we have in our laboratory in particular is what are those effects once those nano-sized plastics get to those other tissues like the liver or in our particular case, the placenta. So not that this is your place to say, but what should be done with this information, both from the consumer side and then also, you know, for folks who are in the policy making position? Yeah, so this work is really landing in that awareness category because like we talked about at the beginning, it's something that you can't see, but now we can confirm that they are indeed there. So I think bottled water definitely has its place if the water that is in a community isn't safe for lead, for example, or natural disaster, then we need to rely on bottled water in those cases. I think if you have the chance to reduce plastic intake, since we don't know what the health effects are yet, I think that's a good decision. So reducing bottled water use not only reduces the chance of this ingestion, but also reduces that single use risk as well. I think at the moment we're just ahead of the game for policymakers and regulation that we, we know that they're there and I'm not sure it's wise to wait for all of the health effects before we start to wonder if they should be there. It's good advice, no doubt. Dr. Phoebe Stapleton is a professor of pharmacology and toxicology at Rutgers University. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. In our Spotlight on Business report, brewery and distillery owners are celebrating today after Governor Murphy signed a long-sought bill to ease restrictions on their businesses. The new law removes a cap on the number of events breweries can hold and lets them sell snacks and non-alcoholic drinks. They can also now partner with food trucks. Murphy signed the bill after the legislature rewrote it to add in reforms to the state's century-old liquor laws. That includes boosting the number of liquor licenses by bringing nearly 1,400 inactive licenses back into the marketplace and creating a new category of licenses for restaurants and malls that should free up existing licenses for restaurants located in downtowns. Murphy's made liquor reform a key priority to help those restaurants harmed by the pandemic, but advocates say the bill doesn't go far enough to help with scarcity or affordability since some of those can go for upwards of a million dollars. Turning to Wall Street, stocks fell to start the first day of a shortened trading week. Here's how the markets closed. Well, after 50 years of legislative service, longtime Senator and former Governor Dick Cody is trading his trips to Trenton for retirement. He leaves as the longest serving lawmaker in New Jersey history, retiring nearly five decades to the day he was first sworn in, spending eight years in the Assembly, 42 in the Senate, two stints as Senate president, and 14 months as governor following Jim McGreevy's resignation. It's quite a run, and he joins me now. Governor, good to see you. Why on earth would someone want to spend 50 years in Trenton? Because every day you're helping people, dealing with people, and I enjoy people and enjoy doing things for people. And I um, thought I did a good job. People related to me. So uh, I'm blessed. 
in many, many ways. You, of course, are known for your work with mental health, maternal health, the ban on indoor smoking, yes. uh, the negotiations yes. for MetLife Stadium, oh, yeah. the undercover governor. You went into a state psychiatric hospital, into a shelter in Newark. You've done your homework. <laughs> yeah, I've been covering you for a couple of years. Um, I'm unusual, obviously. How did you find your path in the legislature uh, for what you wanted to work on? Um, I just thought, you know, I didn't want to be a ho-hum legislator. I wanted to be different and get things done. And when you do it in a dramatic fashion, it makes it easier uh, to get it done. So when you go into a psychiatric hospital, which is a dump at that time, after you come out, it gets fixed up. You've also, Governor, been pretty vocal about party bosses. How do you survive in a political climate like New Jersey's when party bosses have quite a bit of say? I mean, everything down to the ballot. Well, um, I've survived. I run against the organization many times and won. People say, oh, you can't win. Hell, you can't. Make your case. We made our case on numerous occasions, and you won. But there's good party bosses, and there's bad party bosses. Who are the bad party bosses? Well, they don't live around this area. <laughs> Where do they <laughs> I live? Say. I don't want to go south on anyone. Uh -huh, uh -huh, we get it. Um, okay, but then that I have to ask then. Sure. You ran in the primary. You uh, ousted your colleague, Nia Gill, who was moved into the district after the maps were redrawn. And then two months later, you announce your retirement. Correct. And then ultimately, the ticket gets decided by party bosses. Is that not a little hypocritical? I don't know if it was. It, uh, listen, the party boss there is Leroy Jones, a good friend of mine, who ran off the line against the party with me back in 93. And I've known his family a long time. So like I said, there's bad party bosses and there's good party bosses. And, you know, they exist. you got to fight them. And... Some people stand up and do the right thing, and the people who are representing me in the legislature are very happy with it, especially John McKean. He's been a longtime friend and uh, a good legislator. Were you upset at all about how it played out um, with the Gills switching names on the ticket? First it was Brendan, it was his wife, it was Brendan, it was his wife. Um, well, that, that was up to uh, <laughs> Mr. Jones to make that decision. So I think in the, at the end of the day, he made a right decision. Um, let me move on. There was a, a number of bills, obviously, that you have either sponsored or co-sponsored. And I'm thinking about the indoor smoking ban because that was something that you were really passionate about. Um, it has not yet made it for the casino workers. Is there right. something more you think could have been done to get that over the finish when line? I was governor. I instituted the smoking ban in the state of New Jersey. And I'm extremely proud of it. We saved the lives of many New Jerseyans because of it. Smoking is only allowed in New Jersey in a casino. And it's allowed because the party bosses in South Jersey do business with the casinos. And they've been able to stop it in the legislature. Very sad, but true. Hopefully that will change. I don't know if it will, though but it's a very, very small group of people. What will you miss and who will you miss most uh, from your time in the legislature? No, just being around the people in the legislature and all the good people who worked there and who worked for me and under me and did a fantastic job. You know, I loved every minute of it. Uh, somebody was <laughs> talking to me or talking about the um, day I made a speech to the legislature and the teleprompter broke down, so, which it did. Mm -hmm. So I had practiced it so many times that I basically had memorized it. But every time I got a round of applause, I'd step aside and I'd say to the, to the clerk, damn, teleprompter's broken, tell somebody. <laughs> you had a lot of good times there. Should oh. we expect to see, like we've seen from past uh, governors and senators, a, a Cody Institute, a think tank of politics at some <laughs> I university? I don't know if I can think that high. <laughs> but, you know, people like Tom Kane, um, Brendan Byrne, I mean, you know, I idolized those people. In fact, I was actually a chauffeur for the Kane family a couple times. 
This was pre-legislative Oh, yeah, service. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are some great stories there. <laughs> Senator, Governor uh, Dick Cody, thank you for your public service and thank you for your time. Thank you. And that's going to do it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. Drive safely. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.